I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Paula Marie Seniors today, but before I introduce her, I want to point out that she brought her father. Where are you, Mr. Seniors? There he is. This is Clarence Seniors. And not only um, is he here uh, as a proud parent, he is one of the founders of the civil rights movement and he participated in sit-ins and is a hero to those of us who look towards the civil rights movement um, as the start of many social movements and really great changes in our country. So hopefully afterwards the students can shake your hand, maybe take a picture with you. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so now I will introduce Paula because this is all about her today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Paula Marie Seniors is a historian at Virginia Tech um, and an ethnic studies scholar. She's an associate professor of Africana Studies and she's the biographer of Mae Mallory and the Monroe Defense Committee. Um, her parents, Audrey Seniors and Clarence Seniors, founded the Monroe Defense Committee, um, which is what prompted her interest in this subject. She uh, has a forthcoming book uh, about Mae Maller Mallory, which explores why working class African American women, Mae Mallory, Mrs. Ethel Johnson of the Negroes with Guns movement, her mother, and Mallory's daughter chose radical activism. So Pat Mallory is here as well? Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think you're going to have a lot to say about all of this, but I just want to say we're very honored to have you here. And you brought a <laughs> youngster with you as well. My daughter, Shaquilla Glover Seniors, is here. Thank you so much. We're so honored to have you here at St. Francis College. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to ask the people, um, if you are with Workers World, can you either stand or raise your hands in acknowledgement? I want to acknowledge all the people from Workers World Party. OK, let's give them a round of applause. All right. And I'd also like to acknowledge Anybody here who was in the Monroe Defense Committee, which was part of Workers World Party, so the Workers World people should raise their hands, and the Monroe Defense Committee people raise their hands again, please. Acknowledge them. Okay. If we have any well-placed FBI, CIA, NSA, um, you know, agents here, you know, please let us know that you're here as well, okay? All right, so today, um, I just want to begin with the memory. Um, this is me with May as a child, as a baby I was. And this is me. Can we lower the lights so that we can see the images? So this is me. You can't see in the background, but that light there is Malcolm X. This is at May Mallory's house, May and Pat Mallory's house. Um, they lived in an immaculate house in a tall, tall building in Manhattan and every it seemed like every weekend my mother and I and sometimes Hindi I believe Susie you went too. sometimes we would go up to their house um, and they would dress us in African garb and they just loved us and this was our family and this is um, what I remember this is a memory we would drive the train from Brooklyn to Harlem so today Today, I want to talk about May Mallory, the Monroe Defense Committee, and World Revolutions. In 1961, May Mallory, an African-American working class woman and self-defense advocate, traveled to New York, from New York to Monroe, North Carolina, to provide support and weapons to the Negroes with Guns movement, which was founded by African-American Robert F. Williams. This had been the, the, um, the NAACP in Monroe, but because of the Klan and the white supremacists that were attacking the African-American community, they founded um, arms to protect women, children, and their um, community from the Klan. So accused of kidnapping a Ku Klux Klan couple, May spent 13 months in a Cleveland jail and faced extradition to Monroe. Um, African-American women radical activists aligned, these women were aligned with leftist and self-defense ideologies. Um, they belonged, um, they were Trotskyists and so on. Um, these women, Mrs. Ethel Azalea Johnson of the Negroes with Guns movement, she was my adopted grandmother. Um, 
May Mallory, which as I said, was our family member. This is my father with May Mallory. My mother, Audrey Proctor Seniors, and Pat, Pat Mallory. These women, um, these women and my father, Clarence Seniors, and the Workers' World Party founded the Negro, the Monroe Defense Committee to support May Mallory as well as the Monroe defendants accused of kidnapping the uh, Klan couple. Pat Mallory, she's here. Pat Mallory, who was 16 years old, also participated in the Monroe Defense Committee. These women and my father bonded permanently as family. When the Mallory case ended, we all moved to New York, okay? Um, my mother, um, Pat and May, joined international revolutionary movements in Tanzania, Grenada, and Nicaragua. Mrs. Johnson participated in world revolutions through her writings, advocating for an end to colonialism, imperialism, and um, in support of non-white nations. They were under extreme FBI surveillance. So this is an image from the FBI of Mrs. Johnson extreme FBI surveillance. They connected African-American leftist civil rights activism to world revolutions. Through their writings, protests, and as social theorists, they emerged as what Antonio Gramsci and George Lipsitz define as organic intellectuals, studying their worlds and disseminating their ideas through, quote, um, social contestation, end quote, guiding the thoughts and desires of their class without an official intellectual position. They also embodied Collins' everyday political activist within Kumba's motherist frame. So today I will explore what led these women to actively participate in world revolutions. The beautifully brown-skinned Mrs. Azalea, Ethel Azalea Johnson, was born in Abbeville, South Carolina, a historical community of struggle and resistance in January 31st, 1916. Now, Abbeville played a pivotal role in Johnson's political and intellectual growth and informed her self-defense ideology. Abbeville's African Americans came from martial African stock. They came knowing um, how to fight. And they participated in extreme militaristic and intellectual resistance to white supremacy. So for example, in 1848, some African slaves killed um, their owners and they were very unrepentant about this. Um, they said, quote, they said they had done right and expected to be forgiven for, for it and to get to heaven. They regarded themselves as martyrs in the, case of li in the cause of liberty and say they cheerfully die to better the condition of the other 100 plus blacks on their plantation, end quote. So rather than acting as a restraint, lynching, Murders of African Americans who fought back, I contend, compelled Abbeville's African Americans to push even harder against suppression. So these are the lessons that Mrs. Johnson learned. She took these lessons to Monroe in 1946 and utilized them in founding, as a founding member of the Negroes with Guns movement. She utilized it as the editor of The Crusader and the writer of the column, Did You Know? She utilized these lessons as the founder and chairman of the Revolutionary Action Movement in Philadelphia, which was Abbeville's sister city, and as a member of the Monroe Defense Committee, and as the editor of the, quote, militant bi-weekly freedom publication, Did You Know? Which was published by she, my mother, and my father. Johnson cultivated an anti-colonialist, pan-Africanist, black nationalist ideology coupled with Cubanismo, Maoism, and Trotskyism, which she learned from my parents and as well as her own readings. 
She also utilized her own mother's lessons. Did you know, April 29, 1961, many times my mother talked to us about the oppressions that all black people were enduring here in America. She related to us dreams and aspirations that her parents had hoped for their children. My grandparents were slaves. So what Johnson reveals here is her grandparents' hope for a better life for their, their children. Um, and Mrs. Johnson also learned and taught her readers lessons in self-defense, quote, and then, as so it is now, the oppressed people must rise up, rise up and fight. Freedom is everybody's job. She also taught her readers her mother's life lessons. Her mother worked as a maid and a laundress. These were hard job, a hard job. And her mother knew that hegemony shattered and erased her rights. Quote, my mother never had freedom like white people had. Her rights were denied her, and she knew it. Yes, my mother knew that she and her four parents, along with millions of other Afro-Americans, had been deprived of their human and civil rights. In her unpolished way, she planted the seeds of discontent in her children discontent with any and everything inhumane. Never rest contented, she'd say, until all men are free. One thing the Jim Crow laws and discriminatory policies of America did not do to her, break her spirit and her lust for freedom. Mrs. Johnson's mother taught her children that it was not enough for them to free themselves, but that they must fight for freedom for all, aggrieved communities of color, and for all African Americans. Now, most poignantly, she tells us, quote, my mother never experienced living as a free person but she was always free in her heart. So Mrs. Johnson's mother's love and lessons shaped her ideology. In 1963, the FBI noted that informant PHT3, Philadelphia T3, and CE2, another informant in Cleveland, told them that Mrs. Johnson, formerly of Monroe, North Carolina, is chairman of a Negro organization known as the Revolutionary Action Movement. So during great times of stress, Johnson left Monroe for Philadelphia, where, where her relatives lived, and where she maintained a friendship with 19-year-old Max Stanford, and where after the 1961 Monroe riots, she co-founded RAM. She co-founded it with Stanford. So RAM under Johnson advocated, um, advocated for, um, and advocated, and she charged the, the, um, colonized dis diasporic youth to lead world revolutions. This is what she told the kids of Ram to do. So in 1963, she wrote about Ram's bellicose response to police attacks on demonstrators who were picketing for jobs. Quote, many Afro-Americans, after witnessing the attacks on their relatives and friends on the lines, left, but returned with 45s and straight razors, end quote. So this gives us a window of how her ideology of self-defense influenced Ram's combat-ready youth. So also, in a clever way, Mrs. Johnson taught her readers 
those she administrated to in the Crusaders Association for Relief and Enlightenment, and those she administered to in her educational initiatives about world revolutions. The calamitous conditions of Monroe mirrored that of Batista's Cuba. Starving children, extreme poverty, deplorable living conditions, and educational inequality. She, um, in Monroe, for example, she wrote of one father who was unemployed and sick, quote, and the mother hasn't been able to get up after giving birth six weeks ago. The children were ragged, the home was in need of everything, and the welfare agency refuses to give them any help. So modeling after the Cuban Revolutionary Initiatives beginning in 1958, with the help of my parents and volunteers, the Crusader Association for Relief and Enlightenment did what the state would not do. They offered food, clothing, shoes, a food garden, and enlightenment. They predated the 1970 Black Panthers free breakfast program. Now finally, Mrs. Johnson and her husband advocated for world revolutions, connecting them to African-American condition. Did you know 1966? We wish for all of you a new year filled with victories in the struggle for liberation of, the, of oppression. We wish continual victories in the international liberation struggles. Long live the great leaders of the international liberation struggles. Long live the people of the international liberation struggles. Our New Year toast. May the eyes of the people on the local front be open and their ears unstopped so that they may hear the roar of world revolutions and do what must be done for the strength of the organized masses is inevitable. Ray and Ethel Johnson, season's greetings. So with this toast, Johnson connected world revolutions in the Congo, Vietnam, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, everywhere. She wrote about this. Um, and she connected them to African-American freedom struggles and compelled her readers to join her in the struggle for freedom. May, May Mallory, weighing in close to 10 pounds, I arrived on the scene that day, June 9th, 1927, in Macon, Georgia, to a working class semi-agrarian family. Self-defense. <sighs> Never have I had any fear of white people, nor felt that I was inferior to anyone. So in 1930, at the age of three, while living with her cousin in Macon, Georgia, May formulated a self-defense ideology. A white female store owner, Mrs. Saloon, offered black children maggot-filled cheese. Mallory, I slapped that garbage out of the woman's hands, and she slapped me, and I ran home crying. So this cousin made me explain to her why I was crying. Somehow or another, I just told my cousin that this little girl had hit me. She told me to go back, and even if Mary Saloon had crawled up her mother's dress to hit her, or I wasn't coming into the house. So I went back to the, to the store, and Mary was behind the counter, and I went back there, and, and I popped her, you see. And then I ran home. <laughs> Mrs. Saloon called the police and 15 motorcycle cops came to the house looking for that little nigger who hit a white woman, end quote. Mallory's cousin castigated the police. Why you white people are so stupid. You mean you had to come for, you know, this, this little fat ball of flesh. That was me, she held me up. She said, now don't you look ridiculous. She really made them feel a fool. 
So they told her that she would have to teach me that I would have to respect white people. So my cousin told them that you have to respect us. So Mallory's cousin gave May a self-defense model to emulate, which proved successful for neither the officers nor the white supremacists retaliated against the family in a state that according to a red record ranked number one in lynchings. So while May and her cousin escaped harm, Mallory recalled that they left Georgia soon after the incident for Brooklyn because my mother could tell that I wasn't going to make it so good in the South. So in Brooklyn, May cultivated a love of learning. She wanted to be a scholar. The public schools thwarted that hope and her family had other plans. May. By the time I was 17, my family decided that I should get married. Not to a city slicker, but to somebody who was used to work in the soil. So they picked for me a husband. In 1944, the family brokered an arranged marriage with children in the mix, pregnant at 17 with Pat and at 18 with Butch. May revolted. Now, I love babies, but I think there is something else in life besides having and rearing it. I just couldn't cope with this thing. So my husband I could, and I could just not make it. Hmm, I left him with children in tow. So May chose a life of learning, political activism, joining the Communist Party and workers unions, unable to co-join motherhood and activism. She left the child rearing to her aunt and her husband at 103rd Street using Sudakasa, Gutman, and Haneke's um, description of shared parenting, socialization to address the family's economic and social reality. By 1957, she fought to desegregate the New York City public schools on Pat's behalf. She joined the communists and the black nationalists, but she couldn't reconcile um, their contempt for black women. So the only place she found agency was the Negroes with Guns movement, and she founded the Crusader family in Harlem to support them through fundraisers and arms. Now in Monroe, the national branch of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement for Co of Colored People, the Freedom Riders, and Martin Luther King, and others sought to teach Monroe's African Americans the effectiveness of passive re resistance. They founded the Negroes with Guns movement to protect themselves from white supremacists, but these folks were going to teach them the effectiveness of passive resistance. In August 1961, they sent the Freedom Riders to Monroe. Now, Robert F. Williams and the Negroes with Guns movement and Mrs. Johnson anticipated that Monroe would erupt in white on black violence. Mrs. Johnson and the Williams asked their followers for physical support. And May Mallory answered their call, as did African-American writer Julian Mayfield. On Sunday, August 27th, 1961, 5,000 armed Ku Klux Klan men, including the police, viciously attacked the demonstrators, invaded the heavily armed and trained black community. And a Ku Klux Klan couple, the Steagles, pushed their way into the Williams home where they sheltered them from the angry black, black people. Um, they left unharmed, but May recall that Chief Monty called them and quote, threatened to have us all hanging by our heels within 30 minutes, end quote. Robert F. Williams and his family abandoned May Mallory and escaped to Cuba. Julian Mayfield abandoned May Mallory and escaped to Ghana. And May made her way um, to New York City and learned that the authorities charged them all with kidnapping the Steagles. The FBI described May as a loud talker violent nature, carry 22 
pistol in Brazil should be considered armed and dangerous. So she fled to Cleveland. Now Pat, May's daughter, says that, you know, some of my relatives let the FBI know where she was. May, on Thursday night, October 11th, 1961, 25 members of the FBI swooped down on my landlord's house to arrest me. It literally rained cops. They grabbed me up so fast they nearly ran off and left a few of their men stranded without rods back to the headquarters. She spent 13 months in jail and faced extradition to Monroe. Now, according to May, the Monroe Defense Committee, quote, a group with the way out philosophy of self-defense against mobsters, end quote, led by my mother, Audrey Proctor, my father, Clarence Henry Seniors, and the Workers' World Party, um, came to May's defense. They were the only group. There were a couple of other groups that were founded, but this was the only group. Nobody else would touch the case. So how did May survive incarceration? Dream escape. Mallory used what I define as dream escape. She wrote herself out of prison through tales of fighting hegemonic oppression. And this story I'm about to read to you, her story about Christina, um, who she met in jail. Christina stood by the window in her cell and saw, quote, a long, shiny, new Cadillac, end quote. Out of the car came, quote, a tall, ebony-hued man, the picture of Bond Street. Christina screamed out the window, hey, baby, get out of my new shoes, my suit, my coat, and my shirt. Those are my rags. When I found you, you had nothing but your naked ass. Now you driving a long Cadillac, dressed in fancy clothes, lots of money in your pocket and money in the bank. All I got from you were beatings, cuts, and bruises. So Paula C. Johnson in Inner Lives connects the abuse of girls and women like Christina to incarceration. But Christina refused victimization, and she glazed claim on her property. The man yelled up, shut up, you bitch. Christina said, <laughs> that's all right, Daddy. I'll see you in church. The prosecutor and I got together on you. Huh, you're on your way, Daddy. You're going to Columbus, where they won't let you wear my fine clothes. I'll be wheeling your Cadillac, daddy, daddy. I'm hitting the streets after the trial. Now, I think we all agree we need, we need to see her triumph. And May provides um, the hope that we want to see for Christina. Quote, one day after lunch, Christina was lying in bed browsing through the true story. A voice yelled, look out your window, mama. I got a scribe for you. A, a scribe is a letter written by one inmate to another on a different floor and passed in a variety of ingenious ways. So Christina's prediction came true. For that scribe came from the jailed ebony hued man, proving that karma was a chick named Christina. So May wrote that and that's how she survived her incarceration. So this is my mother, Audrey Proctor Seniors. She was born on October 24th, 1940 at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. She was a, um, a, in 1958, she was a diminutive 17 year old a recent high school graduate and an advocate for self-defense. And she took her initial steps towards radical activism. Proctor, my first involvement in the area of social and political change began in New Orleans in the late 1950s. Along with a number of my peers, I became 
a card-carrying member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which at that time was a very radical thing to do. So indeed, becoming a member of New Orleans NAACP proved extremely radical, given that the FBI surveilled the group beginning in the 1940s, deeming them subversive because the members included black female teachers, union members, Communist Party members, and the working and the middle class. In 1956, the Citizen Council and the state made it illegal to belong to the NAACP. They were banned for 10 years. So my mother became radicalized and politicized by the group. She was an unrepentant and unapologetic socialist and communist. And she was also a follower of Paul Robeson. She named me after him. She was a lifelong advocate of unions, living wages, decent and fair housing, and working conditions. So according to my Aunt Doris Proctor, in 1961, at the age of 21, my mother moved to Cleveland and lived with her Auntie Gladys. She attended secretarial school, became an organic intellectual. She analyzed Lenin, Marx, third world revolutionary theory, and she supported third world revolutions. Um, she became a devotee of the Negroes with Guns movement, joined the Trotskyist Workers World Party, became the office manager of the Monroe Defense Com Committee, met my father, Clarence Henry Seniors, a graduate of Morris Brown College, who chaired the committee, and she joined the Youth Against War and Fascism. Audrey Seniors. In 1964, the extradition battle was lost. May, um, lost for May. Within two weeks after the extradition, I, along with my husband, made our way to Monroe, North Carolina to fight for Mallory. Um, this is my father's FBI fi um, file picture here. This is me marching for freedom. That's my father up there with Ella Baker. This is us doing voter registration. Well, I'm, not, I'm a baby, so I'm not doing it, but they're doing voter registration drive. Okay. Uh, so, in Monroe, she worked with Mrs. Johnson, and she also wrote for the Youth Against War and Fascism Partisan. Um, Ellen Catalanato um, is featured in um, several of these that I have read over time. She's written many articles. She's right here with us. Um, but my mother wrote these two articles, and this one's called Monroe, North Carolina. Quote, there was no moon in sight. It had been pitch dark for some time. I was out of cigarettes and just had to go to the store for a pack. A small group of black men were standing there. I was alone, but not afraid. My mother was fierce. She was not afraid of anything. So she unveils a poor working class African-American Southern scenario of black male idleness. Men, quote, always in tatters, worn out shoes, hand-me-down threadbare overcoats, always surrounded by all the small children of the neighborhood. They never at any season seem to have a job or anything special to do." End quote. So she allows us to see hope and the love of the children who engulf the men. She also talks about women that come and speak to the men as well. And she, she surmises that these are probably their wives or girlfriends or, or a, some kind of partner of some sort. So she allows us to see hope. So a concerted effort in Monroe to keep Monroe's black males unemployed um, occurred. According to the history of African-Americans in North Carolina, um, these men as Nadison Poole Smith and Lipset notes were victims of, quote, the man in the house and substitute father welfare laws that legally, legally denied them and their partners welfare. My mother observed the meth men through the store window. They seemed to be waiting in burning anticipation for something. And then all of a sudden it happened. 
before the storekeeper could get out of sight after dumping the last container of garbage, these men lit out the trash pile so fast I was stunned. And with tears in my eyes, I realized what was going on. I was not looking at a pack of hungry dogs who, who with a decided purpose attack our garbage cans at night and strew trash all over everywhere. I was not looking at alley cats who sometimes have the courage to attack these hungry dogs when they get there, when they get there first. I was not looking at a pack of vicious baby-eating rats who are no strangers to tenement houses. I was looking at men, would-be, strong-bodied men who speak back to me as I say hello to them, respecting me as I respect them. Grown men who I see every day. She was bereft over their transformation into beasts, starving and ravenous, their downward spiral into the abyss of desperation. And I am most certain that she counted my father and herself lucky and questioned the humanity of the storekeeper who could have easily left the food out and allowed the man some humanity. Audrey, there is no doubt in my mind that they want sincerely to be and would be good providers for their wives and children if they had a chance to make it, to make an honest living. But there's no chance in Monroe or in many other black communities in the South. There's no chance, no chance. There isn't even a chance to be nothing but a man. Their transformation into beasts, starving and ravenous, their downward spiral into the abyss of desperation. And I am most certain that she counted my father and herself lucky and questioned the humanity of the storekeeper who could have easily left the food out and allowed the man some humanity. Audrey, there is no doubt in my mind that they want sincerely to be and would be good providers for their wives and children if they had a chance to make it, to make an honest living. But there's no chance in Monroe or in many other black communities in the South. There's no chance, no chance. There isn't even a chance to be nothing but a man. So in 1965, the Mallory case was won, and Mallory and her family moved to New York. Uh, Mallory and my family, excuse me, moved to New York. We all moved back together. Um, my mother continued her activism with the Workers' World Party, joined the Black Panthers, and marched against Vietnam War and other wars. Um, she, um, in the 1980s, she was very disillusioned by the outcomes of the civil rights movement, which left the poor and working class behind. So my mother traveled to Grenada to participate in that Marxist revolution. Um, we were bereft when um, the U.S. invaded Grenada. Um, she and I, we listened um, to the radio um, in just utter distraught. Uh, we both felt completely devastated. And um, it was horrible. It was a horrible thing. Um, I have a picture. Um, so um, these are the, um, the bullet marks where they killed um, Maurice Bishop. Here is Maurice Bishop being protected. Here he is again. We were devastated, just completely devastated. So in 1979, the Marxist, and I know she would have gone back. She would have continued to go to, um, to Grenada to help with the revolution. But in 1979, the Marxist and progressive Catholic Sandinista revolution successfully toppled the brutal Somoza family dictatorship and the Nicaraguans were enfranchised. My 44-year-old mother went to Nicaragua from 1984 to 1987 as a brigadista picking coffee for the Sandinistas. Um, she organized third brigades 
Third, Third World Brigades through the Nicaragua Exchange and the African American Solidarity Network. So this is her with the African American Solidarity Network. Um, in um, 1984, she met with the mothers of heroes and martyrs in Nicaragua. And mo one mother, whose daughter perished at the hands of the Contras, made an indelible impact on my mother. Um, and she relayed this message to us in, her, um, in this book, Brigadista Harvest, in her essay. Quote, the mother asked us to tell the mothers in the United States not to let their sons come to Nicaragua and invade us. We know what it's like to lose a child and we do not wish it to happen to anyone else. This mother expressed her grief and utter despair and hoped that no other mother would lose a child to war. She extended fellowship mother to mother, but with steely determination and courage, she warned, if your sons come here to invade us, they will be killed that the Nicaraguan mothers would fight back and the casualties would be the visitors' own children. Now this statement greatly affected and made an incredible impression on my mother, for she wrote that, many times since I have reflected on these words and what they mean for black and Latino mothers and families here. History has shown in Vietnam and most recently in Grenada and Lebanon that it is blacks and the poor who are on the front lines fighting United States dirty wars. Black mothers must bury our sons and our daughters and all of us suffer the emotional hardship of their loss to our communities. Now, my mother, I believe, felt insurmountable anguish for the mothers, but she also gained a strength of mind to transform the U.S. system of exploitation. So she chose to fight back, um, fight for the Nicaraguan people and all third world people. She gave radio interviews, speaking to African-American organizations, writing articles in the black newspaper, The City Sun, and working to involve the African-American community in the fight um, against third world um, wars perpetuated by the United States. So this is Pat, beautiful, beautiful Pat. Um, so my earliest memories of Pat are um, of her beautiful soul and her infectious laugh um, and her beautiful dark skin. Uh, we saw Pat mostly every weekend in Harlem. It felt like every weekend. I don't know if it was every weekend, but it felt like every weekend. Um, and um, I've showed you the picture of, of her. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I can't imagine being a mother at 18. It would be so ridiculous and impossible, especially taking care of them by yourself. Two at age 19, <laughs> I guess I would have an attitude every day too. Pat Mallory. So Pat was born in Brooklyn, New York on June 9, 1945, and her brother Butch was born a year later on the same date. Pat, my mother had things to do, people to meet. This business about children, it's in my way. You've got an aunt, you've got a grandmother, and they're home. Make sure you're fed, that you're housed, that you're clothed, that's it. Meanwhile, I'm going to save everybody. Shared parenting allowed the family to infuse these children with retrograde, southern poor, working class, Christian Baptist values, and old fashioned patriarchal and misogynistic norms. And these countered May's beliefs and proved devastating to Pat as well as her brother. May tried, she tried, she tried to instill her children with a love of books and a pride in their blackness. But because she had to work, she was unable to fully protect them from the family. The 1957 school desegregation case 
left 12 year old Pat blacklisted at school with the mother in jail because they incarcerated me for I am arguing for the desegregation case. Um, and Pat was confused and devastated. Now, after an early difficult childhood, Pat er arose. She arose like a phoenix, emerging as an organic intellectual, self-healing as a black nationalist rebel girl at Seward Park High School. Quote, I was living my mother's dream of what she wanted me to do. I considered my, uh, myself a black nationalist since a teenager. Huh, I was just being wild, but going in a positive direction. I'd get up at one o'clock in the morning and meet friends. I'd sing wildly at the top of my lungs in the park. I was running amok in a school environment. So Pat says that her behaviors did not meet the norms of typical teenagehood that parents and their guardians expected. Quote, people were still conservative. Teenage girls were not walking in the streets at one o'clock in the morning, end quote. Now, notwithstanding her wild behavior, Pat excelled at school as the president of the Negro Culture Club, the, multi um, the multiracial symposium club whose sole purpose was fighting against nuclear war because, quote, we were not trying to prepare for war. We refused to participate in the nuclear um, bomb drills. She attended black nationalist activities in Harlem. We got very Afrocentric. We got our African names and the beads representing one God or another. And that was it. I decided to go natural. Abby Lincoln, in fact, did my hair. I hung out with the Yoruba people. Mama KK's Harlem Yoruba Temple. She attended the African National Pioneer Movement, Miss Natural Standard of Beauty Contest, the African Jazz Society's natural, Naturally Fashion Shows with the Grand Dasa Models, the Nation of Islam's Na um, Temple No. 7, where she listened to Malcolm X, and the Highlander Folk School in, in uh, Monteagle, Tennessee, where she attended with other children of civil rights activists. Um, this is a lovely picture that she gave me. Um, of, of when she, uh, during this historic time period. Pat verbally sparred with the boxer Muhammad Ali. Oh, he was such a loud mouth. And as a black nationalist rebel girl, she chose radical activism and advocated for change. So she defended her family against the FBI. In 1961, when, 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 um, when May went to Monroe, Pat, in her teenage glory, was enjoying her freedom, unencumbered by adult authority. Um, when May attempted to escape the authorities, the FBI surveilled the family. They wiretapped their home in Harlem. They harassed Pat and Butch regularly. Pat says that when the FBI came to the house, I was feisty at that time with the FBI. I wanted them to know I was not voluntarily answering their questions. I was trying to live up to my mother's standard. Wow, but I was furious with them. And I told them, you, you, you find the killers of Emmett Till. <laughs> I was about 16. Huh. Yeah, I had come up. Yeah, I had come up, you know. But, but, but I didn't want my grandmother to tell them where she was. My grandmother, she was afraid, but she stood up. So thankfully, Pat and her grandmother escaped the brutalization by the FBI. They had agent provocateurs that were in all these groups and organizations all around us, right? Um, and what VP um, Franklin discusses in Jack Napes. So they, they thankfully escaped any violence. So this is Pat, um, oh, what did I do here? This is Pat marching to save her mother when she was in um, Monroe. And this is um, our black nationalist rebel girl. 
So after her mother's case was won, Pat graduated from high school, made her way to SUNY Stony Brook, where she majored in anthropology education and continued her activism as the president of the Black Student Union. You know, we did what people in the 1960s on campuses were doing. In 1971, Pat moved to Tanzania, quote, I had to go because of what it promised to be. It was an adventure and I believed in African socialism. Prime Minister Nyeri was talking about unity and building a nation, sharing the wealth of the nation, taking care of people, nobody getting more than they needed or deserved. Medicine was free. It sounded so positive and it sounded like a place you know, where we could make a contribution, end quote. So according to Lessie Tate, Andrew Ivaska, Seth Markle, in 1961, Tanzania gained its independence from Britain and the Tanzanian go government adopted Ujamaa, African socialism, as the political ideology for the country. They invited African Americans to help build the country. This happened to all these, Af um, these newly African independent countries. So if you study the Belgian Congo, they invited the Haitians um, to come and help build the country, right? So um, they invited everybody, the blacks, Americans, and they went and also strategically placed CIA agents went as well. Okay. Pat, it was an escape. It was a relief to get out of the US. I was 25. It was change. You could feel free. Your president was black. Everybody around you was black. And you didn't have this racist problem. There were other issues. But the racism thing, you didn't have to worry about it, at least not from the majority of the population. You know, the Indians, of course, um, they felt they were better than the African people. I didn't even wait when I graduated from New York University for any papers. I just went to Tanzania. They needed teachers. So the Mary Knoll nuns established the Tanzanian Missionary Girls Schools in 1958. The government took over the schools in 1969 and the Mary Knowles um, supported African socialism. They supported this. So I asked Pat how she involved herself in the Tanzanian revolution. One of the things that she told me, and I'm going to play this piece of music for you, was that she would have the kids come in um, marching to um, Donnie Hathaway's Sanctuary Band. <laughs> So the kids would march in to this, right? So I asked her how she involved herself in the Tanzanian revolution. Quote, I went to teach English, language, composition, at, um, and Latin in Mwanza at Nganza Secondary School. I just lived the life of a school teacher, supporting the government in that way, not taking expatriate salary but being paid local wages like everyone else. So for Pat, teaching was a political act. So what happened to May? and Pat in Tanzania. 
1971, the FBI reported, May Mallory has an intense desire to go to Africa to live. She is disturbed by the events and conditions in the United States and feels that Africa holds the dream she is looking for. She works steadily and takes every opportunity to work over time. So, and on her off days, she can make money. She works to make money. Pat says, my mother was chomping at the bit. Got the job, got the house, let's go. She was dying to get to Tanzania and I was the vehicle to get there. So in 1972, May rejected capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, and the internal colony to relocate to Tanzania. Now she did what any self-possessed African-American radical woman would do when rejecting oppressive systems. She quit her job as a nurse's aide, went to the post office to let them know she was moving, offering no forwarding address. She deliberately failed to pay her phone bill. And as any true African-American woman revolutionary leaving to join the U.S. for an African revolution would do, she skipped out on her rent. I asked Pat if she had done the same. And she said, no, no, girl, I paid my bills. My mother was gangster. <laughs> so I asked Pat, I said, how did you, you know, how did you enjoy yourself in Tanzania? Quote, I did run wild because, you know, my mother was not there at the beginning. I knew they were coming, my mother and grandmother. I didn't know when they were coming.